My name is Connor. Uh, I work in the city council as a land use person, but um, I also like to do this kind of mapping and data science analysis um, in my free time. Uh, and I try to apply it to my work as well, but I try to approach this as a hobbyist and, and you know, bear with me as we move through this. I'm, my, you know, my, my biggest goal here is to encourage other folks to, um, you know, take that first step in the data analysis side of things. If you don't feel super comfortable with coding or with, you know, you have questions about the open data, but you're not really sure where to get started. And we're going to work through um, an example uh, that I've worked on in the past. I've kind of edited it to the to this session that looks at um, affordable housing. And so let's start session goals. Um, you know, I tried to target folks who, like I said, are maybe novice hobbyists in interested in this type of data and how um, it impacts their lives or or the, the people who live in the city, um, you know, conceptualizing your questions and how to answer them. I always start with, um, you know, just something I'm curious about, see if I can get an answer out of it, out of um, a little bit of working with the data um, and get a basic understanding of how the data and R as a programming language work and how you can use them in your own uh, hobbies and interests. And then, um, just more, more like most importantly, it's just gain a sense of confidence about uh, like what you're able to do. Um, I know that for me, that was the biggest barrier was just thinking that I could do this kind of analysis on my own prior to these questions that I had. Um, if you do want to code along, um, I and uh, one of the slides will give you like a short Bitly link to a GitHub page where you can just see the code. Um, you know, I'm not going to be typing anything out if you go because I don't trust myself enough, but um, we're just going to be looking line by line and see, you know, exactly what everything that every step I take, like how it helps get to our end product. Um, so if you do have R as the language and R Studio as the software, um, download it on your computer, then that's great. If not, we're just following along and hopefully you can use that link later to, um, to uh, you know, practice when you get home. Uh, and you just need an interest and that's it. Uh, very low bit um, So a bit about R versus Studio. Um, so R is a programming language um, that was created for statistic specifically statistical analysis and data science. A lot of language, a lot of languages do other things. R is really good at this. Um, it has a little bit of of uh, visualiz visualization programs as well, which we'll be using. Um, it's an object oriented language. The way I understand that is a lot of the code involves assigning things to an object um, and then manipulate changing that object and then eventually maybe looking at it that object can be a spreadsheet it can be uh, a visualization you know it can be uh, most it's mostly going to be a data frame you know just like x and y like you see on excel um, and it it consists of base r which was sort of the fundamental package of, and library of the, of the coding language. It has basic arithmetic, basic syntax to actually be a functioning language. But then all sorts of people have created their own um, unique libraries and packages to uh, build on what base R started. Um, and then R Studio is the integrated development environment, which basically means it's just how you interact with the language. It's really helpful. I found it to be a really clean and um, easy uh, software program to code in R with. Um, it even tells you when you've messed up, which is great, which happens a lot. Um, and if you can track all the objects, you can track your files, and um, you can even view the spreadsheets in, in R Studio, which we'll be doing. Um, my very simple methodology, which is just a, it's, it's a very common methodology uh, for data science. We have, we start with our question. Um, we pull the data we need. Uh, we clean it up so we can work with it. Then we work with it. And then you can map that or view it and analyze your results. Uh, and we can see, you know, if we've answered our question, if we need to go back to one of these steps and try it again. Um, so it's a very straightforward methodology, but I think it's a helpful reminder of like what this process really looks like. Uh, and so our question or my question, 
Um, what is the affordable rent for each neighborhood's population? And how does that compare to the rents of affordable housing built um, or preserved in that neighborhood? Um, or um, basically how affordable is a city's affordable housing to its local community? And again, the th I think I want to disclaimer, you know, this is just one way of looking at the data. I'm not saying what's happening is good or bad. I'm just saying um, that this is something that I feel like is often overlooked. Um, you know, in my job, they get a lot of people coming in who can't afford to live in the neighborhood they grew up in. Um, and they ask for help and we, it's, it can be really difficult because even the affordable housing that's being built in a neighborhood is not affordable to that. And so this just looks at that, how, um, you know, how that varies across the city and the city's neighborhoods, some neighborhoods with a uh, mostly wealthier population might have some affordable housing that they could easily uh, afford. Uh, but some lower income neighborhoods might have a bunch of affordable housing, but if it's not hitting the incomes of those of that population, then that's maybe something to think about. Um, so this is the bit lady. <laughs> if you want to just take a set, I'm like, yeah, I think this was the easiest way to do it. Um, it should pop up as a GitHub page with just all the code. GitHub is just helpful because it keeps the, the formatting of the code as, as opposed to like a Google Doc. Um, so I'll just leave that on the uh, screen for a second. And then we'll look at the data that the data set that we'll be using. And then we will dive into our studio. And, and I think, you know, we might have some time for questions at the end, but feel free to just interrupt me as well if you have any questions about anything you've seen before. You have to type it and it's case sensitive for all current. Well, it, it is case sensitive. I wasn't sure actually. Dar, thank you. Or are you knowing? And again, like, I am not a software developer. Like I am not, I didn't study computer science. So I'm not saying that my code is the best code. It is messy, <laughs> and but it works. And so I think that's also part of the learning curve is understanding how to make your code uh, work for what you need it to do and make sure that you can come back to it and not say like, what is this, what, 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 is, what is going on? So with that, you will go over to the data set. So hopefully some of us are familiar with this page. Uh, it's the open data portal that we all love. Um, and so what I will do oftentimes is I'll just start looking through the data sets that are available with just some keywords. So I'll put in affordable housing and just see what pops up. You know, there's tons of data that I, that you can just come across on this data set on this, um, on open data. And so I encourage you to look up, um, whatever you find to be interesting, but this is the data set that I've used for our project today. Um, just looking at it, it's started being tracked in 2014 when Mayor de Blasio started his housing plan uh, because a lot of the income restricted housing that the city built and records started in that time. Uh, and it's continued into the present day because the current mayor has <laughs> continued that policy. Um, and again, um, what they, this is the kind of the data they use to say, oh, we built this many units of affordable housing or we've preserved this many units of affordable housing, uh, preserving meaning it can be existing housing that they continue affordability for, or they implement new affordability measures on existing housing, and then built the new construction of income restricted housing. Um, and so if we look, we can actually just view the data or look at some stats. Got a lot of views, um, a lot of rows and 41 columns. And so if we actually want to look at what those columns are, we, um, we have some, you know, project identifiers, uh, some basic address information, and they actually get into latitude, longitude is recorded, um, because that's how we're going to find out where that building is, what neighborhood it's in. Uh, and then they have this breakdown of the units and these, these turns extremely low, very low correspond to income levels. Um, and. I know that, you know, extremely low income is zero to 30% of area median income. And if you don't know what area median income is, it's a term that the city um, uses to measure um, its affordable housing. It actually includes all five boroughs 
as well as a few counties outside of the city. And they take that number and then they um, take a percentage of that income and then that'll be uh, the income limit of a unit. So if you're building a unit that's 30% of the area median income with 30% of whatever that median income is for the whole city and Westchester and I think another county. Um, and so that can be kind of skewed, right? Um, that number, I think right now, uh, for a family of four or family of three, it's well over a hundred thousand dollars. So what that means, you know, for, for a lot of people, that's not a very accurate estimate of what people are making realistically in a lot of areas. So that's kind of the, the impetus of this whole project was to be able to map how that policy kind of mismatches the need. Um, he repeat that policy. So the policy being, um, and it's actually regulated by the federal government. We are allotted um, an area by which they measure the income. And so the area that they chose is the five boroughs plus Westchester County and maybe yes. Suffolk County, yes. which are wealthier neighborhoods than the yes. city. And so what happens is you get this skewed number of um, yes. what is affordable or what is the average New Yorker making. And so um, when that number is around like $130,000 a year, that's what they base, and anything under that, they basically consider affordable, right? And so if you're making $90,000 a year as a family of three, um, you can be eligible for an affordable apartment. Again, everyone deserves housing, everyone uh, it shouldn't, you know, like there's a lot of perspectives on this, but it often leaves out people who are maybe making uh, fifteen to thirty thousand dollars a year. There can be affordable housing apartments surrounding them, but they can still they still cannot afford that rent because uh, that's that's how like the system sort of bases its affordability. And so that's what I wanted to look at is comparing people's real incomes to the income you have to make to afford one of these affordable units. Um, so we can just get right into it. Um, are there any questions at this point about the data, about where we're, where we're headed? Yes. Question I would have, but you just don't mind. Oh yeah, do you want to turn your mic on? Thank you, then I could hear you better. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, the question um, that I wanted to raise with the issue that I wanted to raise while you were speaking, is the issue of the studio part, which are really, uh, I believe, glamorized a uh, prison cell size apartments that they are pushing a lot of the senior citizens into. Um, and using this formula to uh, validate what it is they're doing. And these are, you know, the people who are, are doing the buildings and developers, along with the politicians who have been allowing this uh, to go on. I don't know if you're going to touch on <clears throat> apartment size <clears throat> and uh, the price of these apartments or the whole philosophy um, be behind that. Because people are so desperate now in New York City, they'll take almost anything. And like I said, the seniors, from what I can see, our senior citizens are being pushed into the very tiny, um, uh, as I said to me, prison cell size uh, uh, apartment. No, yeah, I didn't know if you learned a touch on that. No, sure. I think you raise a really important point. I think there's a lot of um, issues around the way that, like, what you talk about, it's not just about the rent, but the quality of the housing for the for the residents who are living there. I think that. Um, not just yet like four uh, square footage of an apartment, but also a number of bedrooms that are available. Um, the, the unit mix of a building, right? Because um, uh, you could have an affordable building, affordable housing building, but maybe like the majority are studio apartments. So that already cuts families out of the picture. Um, and so there's a lot of, yeah, I think I, I'm mostly talking about uh, the income mismatch. But that's a, like that's an example of like another research question to be able to answer with similar data, right? Because we have right here um, 
uh, the bedroom size of each unit. So you could do the same thing. You could measure average family size of that neighborhood and compare it to the average room size or the average unit size that they're giving that neighborhood, right? And there could be a huge mismatch. Um, you could have a bunch of studios while like the, the maybe the average family is three people. Uh, and it's the same thing with seniors. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's a lot to touch on. And I think that those are examples of great research questions. I don't know if I'm going to be touching on it specifically today. And just another quick, just, just another quick uh, question. Were you able to look at whether HPD is really a part of this, this miscue in terms of apartment size and uh, the buildings that are, are, are being built mm -hmm. along with city plan, but that's a whole separate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, well, this, these buildings are all under HPD supervision and uh, they usually like receive some sort of subsidy and uh, in, in exchange for that, that's when they implement affordability regulations that, I mean, there's a host of policies that result in the creation of these units. Uh, I can't say exactly what leads to what, but um, they're usually partnerships between a developer and a city agency. Uh, any questions? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just quickly, um, the rent for like the low income, all of the end, how is the rent calculated based on the income? So um, that's a good question. I believe the way that they do it and the way that I'm, there's kind of a common um, metric that people use where it's 30% of your income goes toward your rent. And if you're above that, then you're considered rent burdened. And if you're not, then that's considered you can afford your rent. And so what I was looking at is they actually have in here, um, they have the, the income levels. And so you can either compare income to income or you can compare rents to rents, right? Like what an actual affordable rent is to the rent that they're providing, or you can compare uh, an actual income to the income they're assuming that unit holders didn't have. But ge generally people consider, they measure it as 30% of your rent for, per month. Um, okay, so we'll switch into the code. Um, and, you know, I think, yeah, I think this raises a lot of important pieces about, like, the context here, right, of, like, the policy and how the city decides to do things. And I don't want to necessarily, you know, I don't want to necessarily, you know, call anyone out uh, in particular um, and reiterate that, you know, this is, like, why this sort of open data access is so useful, right? Is that you can kind of just then use this data to decide for yourselves what 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 people are doing right, what people could improve on, um, and kind of help educate yourself on the issue. And that's that's how I've learned so much about this is through um, access to this kind of information. So to get started, we have a, like I kind of tried to break it up into the uh, the elements of the methodology. Um, this is our studio. You have four windows. You have like your coding window, your console, which just kind of shows all the processes Then you're doing some files then you're accessing. And then this is where all the objects are going to pop up as we create these objects that we're going to be working with. And again, I thought it might be a little confusing, but if, when I say an object, I mean, usually a spreadsheet, right? Uh, like a spreadsheet file that you would find uh, on your computer um, as we're creating them or manipulating them, they'll populate and be environment. So the first thing we have to do is install the packages that we're going to be using. The first is called Tidyverse. It's kind of a family of libraries all about data sites for R. Um, it includes a ton of functions that you can use to add columns, to remove columns, to um, just manipulate the data how you need to how you need to use it. Shiny and Shiny Themes and Shiny Dashboard are the mapping, or sorry, not the mapping, but the, um, the right, the visualize, the, the, it's a way to host your own little web page of the visualizations that you've created. Leaflet is the mapping package, so it helps you create these nice uh, colorful maps that interpret um, the data the way you want them to. Um, SF stands for simple features, I believe, or spatial features, and um, it's another spatial data package that we use a few of those functions in in this coding uh, session um, to help 
uh, manipulate some of that data. We use Excel. Um, we use one Excel spreadsheet, which is the census data, because um, that's separate, right? Um, the affordable housing data set that we're using doesn't talk about income of that neighborhood. So we need to uh, pull that separately. And that package lets us do that. And then our Socrata is the package that helps us take the open data that we just looked at and import it into our studio. Um, so those are just sort of the general purposes of the packages. And um, for after you install them, you have to uh, basically set them up for your environment. You have to say, I want to use this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And then we're ready to go. Um, we have all our packages ready. Um, we haven't created anything or changed anything, so the environment is still empty. Um, but the first thing we're going to do is gather all the data that we're going to be using. So we're pulling the data. Uh, the first thing we need are called NTAs, which are neighborhood tabulation areas. They're um, the closest thing we have to um, a neighborhood uh, geography in the city. And so that's going to be um, in our final map. I'm going to show each neighborhood. And the, the next thing we're going to have to do is assign the data that we're trying to look at to those neighborhoods. So we'll do that in a bit. So first we have to um, import that. And then you'll see it pop up in the environment. NTA, so there's 262 neighborhoods in this data set. They have 12 variables. The variables, which are like columns, um, just say basic information like the name, if they have any kind of code, identifier, um, but it doesn't say anything about what we want yet. We're just, we just need that spatial information. Um, we're going to only select a few uh, of the columns that we care about. We don't need all 12 columns. So to do that, we're going to run this next function, um, select NTA 2020, NTA name, and geometry. Um, those are the three columns that we care about, which are the individual identifiers of those uh, neighborhoods as well as the geometrical, the geometry information um, of, those, of those neighborhoods. So like what shape are they, where in the world are they, that kind of thing. Um, next, we're gonna pull in our affordable projects, which is the data set that we looked at. I'm gonna call it affordable projects data, um, just because that works for me. Like there's really, I believe like there's no way to you don't have to call anything anything else. I called NTAs because I know they're called NTAs. Affordable project data sounded right to me. But when you're working through this, you can call it whatever you want. Um, and this read Socrata function, like I mentioned from our Socrata, basically um, goes to the website we were at, takes the data, and brings it into our environment. Now, you usually you need a token and an email, a password. We're just using mine. You can use mine. I, uh, you don't, I, I guess I would recommend you don't use mine forever, but, <laughs> but you can use it for this. It's very low stakes. Again, they don't really care. Um, I don't really care. So you need to say who you are and who's pulling it. Uh, so to do that, we just go down and what I'm doing right now, just so you know, is, um, it's like a control enter, which just runs that element of the script. And anytime there's a new element, um, um, it'll stop. It only does one at a time. And so I've tried to break it up into sections here to kind of make it clear what we're doing. But you just do one thing at a time, and it's helpful, very methodical that way. Some languages just work where it does everything all at once. But I like R because um, you kind of just do one one action at a time. Um, are, there any, is this, are there any questions at this point? Yes, really quick technical one. I, I'm the mining for the dependencies to download for like 15 minutes. Is that normal? Nah. Yes. So the dependencies can take a long time, so especially tidyverse because it's so big. Um, but um, what we can do is you have the code, right? So if it does finish up, um, you'll be able to catch up pretty quickly just because um, you think it's all there for you. But I guess like we'll just keep moving just so I can explain what everything is, and then you can run it on your computer maybe at the end. Does that work? Okay, great, thanks. Um, so we've downloaded the, the neighborhood shapes. We've downloaded the affordable project spreadsheet uh, that we already looked at. 
And now this download file function is going to download the census data, that be the income data, which is the last remaining piece of data that we don't have from that one spreadsheet that we already looked at. So to do that, we download, and it actually just downloads a file on your computer and then re-uploads it into um, this, into our studio. And again, whenever we have um, a piece of code and you press control enter, it runs that code. So now we'll decide it as ACS data, which again, just works for me. Um, sometimes that's where it gets kind of messy when you have to have a bunch of different names for things, but I think everyone kind of figures out their own system that works. Um, so now we have all the raw data and now we have to start cleaning the data and making it um, look like we want it to look before we actually start messing with it. Um, and a lot of that can be a little tedious, um, especially since there's a few different data types that you have to work with. The main ones are character data and numeric data. All of this, this big paragraph here, is just changing what are numbers and just telling the computer that they're numbers and they're not words, right? Because it can only run math on numbers. That makes sense. Uh, but it's basically, you'll see, it just says as numeric, as numeric, as numeric, all of these unit numbers are numbers and you're just making sure that the computer knows that they're numbers. Um, but first we are going to create this affordable rent, um, column, which is what we're talking about 30% of your income. And that's literally what that map is right here. Um, I'll put it right here. If you see this, I'm literally saying that this is the income column from the census data and you're dividing it by 12 and multiplying it by 0.3. So you're just saying 30% of your monthly, of your um, monthly income is what you can afford to rent. So we'll run that. And then we'll run this big chunk, which is just cleaning the data. It's just making sure that the data is formatted properly. Um, and, and this filter is an a longitude. What that's saying is some of these, you know, there's going to be errors in any data set you work with. And some of them are missing their longitude latitude data, which we need. And if we try to map that, it's going to send error. So uh, we're just going to remove the ones that don't have a longitude because we can't work with them. Um, and we're going to turn it to that. Um, we are going to attach the NTA data, uh, which has the shape file information. I mean, the, yeah, sorry, the, um, the, uh, geometry information for the neighborhood that it's in because we don't have that rent. This data set, as it just comes as affordable housing projects, is um, it just has where that building is. But we need to know what neighborhood it's in and what that neighborhood looks like. So we'll run that. Um, affordable project by NTA. This one is um, basically them saying how many units and how then putting all that information and converting it to the neighborhood. So after we've run this, I'll run this and then we could take a look at it. This, this way. So before we had this, right? Each row. So this is like a regular spreadsheet, which is why I love art studio. Um, each row is a development, right? Each row, it, it shows you its name. Um, the project start date, and then this is like some of the information that we saw before, right? The income units, a lot of it's zeros because they only have these middle income units, which will come up in the map. Um, and it's just every row is a building. But what we're eventually going to need is have every row be a neighborhood because we're mapping the neighborhoods. We're not mapping the buildings. We're seeing how the neighborhoods compare um, to the developments in, the, in them. So that's what this is. The most recent um, function that we ran created this data set, which is every neighborhood and it's got been unit information in it, right? So we took the unit information from each building, it figured out which neighborhood it was in, and it summed all of those unit counts up. And so we're kind of creating new data sets that don't exist on their own, but that we need them for this mapping project. Um, and we have our ge geometry information. That's, those are the geometry 
that's the geometry information for the neighborhood, right? So it's like the shape of Greenpoint um, and where in the world that shit bit. Any questions at this point? Um, after that, we just have to do a little bit more configuring because as you can see, we're slowly getting to a data set that we can map, right? And so we just have to keep manipulating the data until we can have something that has all the information we need per neighborhood, and then we can actually start looking at it. Um, to do that, we're going to create a final data set that I called NTA affordability. And what that is, is it's the income data, the affordable rents data, the affordable projects um, data, all by neighborhood, right? Because that was the whole point of this, of all of this maneuvering is having a, a spreadsheet that showed every neighborhood, its income level, it's a, what would be affordable to that income level, and then the affordability of the units that were built there, right? So we'll run these functions to essentially, I think I don't need to go, you know, I want to make sure that we can actually start like at the map, but all of all these do is basically get there. And you'll find that sometimes you have to, there's a very roundabout way of getting there, but um, sometimes you have to remove things. It's a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of um, Googling, but you'll eventually get, as long as you know that that end goal is that data set, that data frame that you can, that has everything you need. Um, all of these little steps are just helping you get there. Um, totally. It's just adding some um, columns that we didn't have before. And then this, this one's important just because this is my logic for saying whether or not you can afford an apartment. So I'll just, I'll just look at this. I, it's not super clean because I said my code is messy. Um, but what it's saying is you have these levels of these income levels, right? Like I said, 30% of the area median income, 40%. And that's not really how people's income works. Your income can be anywhere in that range. But what I'm saying, what this is basically saying is, is the affordable rent to that income earner is greater than this number which is one of those AMI levels, then you can count it toward what's affordable to that neighborhood. If it's greater than this number, which is in the lower AMI level, then you can count those units as well. And then so on and so forth until you get to the lowest AMI percentage level that those units are built at. Does that make sense? So like this will be the affordable rent to some of those units. That's a high number, right? $30,000 a month, 3,600. But if the affordable rent in the neighborhood, if it's a wealthier neighborhood where the average income converter can, that's, that's less than 30% of their income, then it counts. Then that's an affordable unit for that, apart, for that neighborhood. And so on and so forth. You'll see that this number, which I would say is, I think about 30% AMI, this, there's going to, this is, these units are going to be a lot more affordable to a lot more neighborhoods. And now that's, what's going to show up in the map. But just to explain, like, this is an important section because this is where we're actually defining what's affordable to a neighborhood and what's not. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is just again, rounding some numbers, converting percentages to look what we want them to look like. Um, and a little bit more cleaning, um, making sure that everything's formatted correctly. And finally, we can actually start mapping the data. Um, Cause now we can actually take a look at this NTA affordability um, spreadsheet and see if it has everything that we need it to have. we we'll take a sec. Okay, great. So first column, this is the neighborhood. This is like every neighborhood has this ID number, um, the borough it's in. This is the income, average median or median household income of that neighborhood. And then therefore the affordable rent, which is 30% of this per month. And then extremely low income units, very low income units, low income units. Uh, what is this? 
this one's like, oh, middle, well, this one's middle income. This one's something in between those two. And then the total number of units, we have an NCA name again, just because sometimes you have duplicates. And then this is the shape of the neighborhood. So that's everything we need. We can compare this rent um, to, to these units, right? And so let me see here. We just go back in because I kind of miss a few columns. Okay, that doesn't look right. But okay, let's just start mapping the data. And so the next the next step is basically um, using this shiny package that we that we installed at the beginning. And the shiny package does like front end, back end, the whole thing to basically host what you mapped onto a website. We're not going to be putting it on a website today, but we're going to look at what it looks like to design that that structure. Um, you have the user interface and the server. Those are just the two objects that you create as a part of um, that map um, or a part of that website. The first one, you're just creating this page, fluid page. It just, when you say fluid page, it just means that it'll expand and shrink as you move the page around. Um, we're putting a map in there and we're giving it the height of 700 because that's what fits the window. And then this server is sort of the back end. It's like the functionality of that website. And to say, and so what we're doing is we're doing a color, we're doing like a color coordinated map of different shades of purple. That's kind of how I decided to do it, where the darker the purple, the more affordable the units are to that area. Um, and then this output map is basically the functionality of the map that we made. Um, these are all basically just inputs of what I want the map to do. Um, we're using this NTA affordability map. We're adding a base map, which is just, it's like a, it's like, it's like Google Maps or something that you see on any kind of online map. It just shows um, what the world looks like. And then we'll add our purple color data on top of it. Um, where, where we're look set view just shows where we're looking. Um, and then we're going to actually add the neighborhoods to the color of the affordability in them. So this just kind of sets, you know, what those neighborhoods look like. Is there a border? What's the color going to be? Like how bright do you want it? Like all of this is just all of these um, settings. And then what I added is a little pop-up menu <laughs> that when you click on it, um, it tells you more information about that neighborhood, the information that's in the data set that we just created. The first thing is the neighborhood name, median household income, number of units that the city says are affordable in that area, and then the percentage of those units that are actually affordable to that neighborhood. You're going to add um, a legend that's just at the bottom that just tells you uh, what you're looking at. Um, just going to give it a title um, and if there's no affordable housing built that they put, what is it going to say? Um, and then that's basically it. Um, we can run this. I just want to make sure. First, I'm going to double check that everything is installed properly. So I'm just going to clear. I'm just going to run this again because I might have missed something. But what we're going to do is see if the map turned out the way I wanted it to. Okay, great. <laughs> And this is, this is the end product, right? Like I'm, when I first made one of these, I was like, wow, that looks pretty cool. <laughs> I think that, you know, it, and then, you know, a lot, what's great about R and shiny and the, the, the packages that we use is a lot of this, we didn't really do, you know, we told it, we told it to put this base map on, but we didn't type out Valley stream or we didn't like, you know, tell you where the water was. A lot of it's already built in. So it makes it a lot easier for folks to create a map like this in whatever it was, like 90 lines of code. Um, as we can, and then we can just start exploring it. Um, the gray, obviously, no affordable housing recorded. So these, these neighborhoods haven't even built affordable housing, let alone whether or not it's uh, affordable to that neighborhood, right? Um, these lighter purple are neighborhoods where they built affordable housing, but uh, compared to the, what people in that neighborhood can afford, it's not really affordable, 
right? And this, we're not even looking at market rate or luxury housing, right? We're, we're just looking at units of housing that the city calls affordable. Um, but we do have some darker areas where, you know, we can zoom into um, like a wealthier neighborhood. And if we click on it, this is the pop-up I was talking about. Um, financial district, Battery Park City, median household income of the two maybe six thousand dollars. They've built 190 units of affordable housing, and all of them are affordable to this person. And that makes sense, right? That's a high income. So that's great. They built 190 units that are affordable to those residents. But right next door, we have Chinatown and two bridges, where the median household income is twenty-seven thousand dollars. They built far more affordable housing units, right? That the city says, look, we built 2,600 affordable units in this neighborhood or preserved 2,600 units in this neighborhood. But for this income earner, 14% are actually affordable, right? And so like, you can do it that way you will, but like, that, that means something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, no, and the, like, the, the sort of like cherry on top is that every one of these units is a lottery unit, right? And for every unit, there's at least a thousand applicants. So it's like there's levels of scarcity there, right? And I think that this is just one perspective on the reality we face with housing. But like, this isn't something that the city is reporting, right? They're recording 2,600 units. But we can see just off of 90 lines of code and data that any of us can look at that only a small fraction of those can people in that neighborhood move into, right? So like, this is where it, I feel like it kind of becomes real is when, you know, in my, in my job, like this is our district. So like we have people who live in that neighborhood and they've lived there for generations and you know, they're getting evicted, something's happening, and they hear about these buildings going up. And we say, you know, the city's not gonna bar you from paying 70% of your rent, of your income toward your rent, but that's not sustainable. So they could apply, they have a one in a thousand chance of getting it, and then they're heavily rent burdened. So it's like, that's kind of like what made me interested in this data and interested in, you know, doing this talk and everything, but um, that's kind of what we're able to show with just a little bit of coding knowledge in my opinion. And so you can just look throughout this map. You know, let's look at Jackson Heights, $62,000 a year. They built only 59 recorded units and only, I guess, six of those units are affordable to Jackson Heights. You can look at, but then, you know, Upper West Side, $127,000 a year. They built a lot of units and they're 100% affordable to that neighborhood. Um, so anyway, that, you know, we can keep looking at this, but, um, sorry. The, there's still a lot of like the gray. So the gray, the gray, I mean, that's JFK. So there's not the <laughs> but, um, you know, Richmond Hill, $75,000, but they, they haven't built affordable housing over there or preserved affordable housing over there. So there's a lot of gaps. Um, and you know, it's, it's interesting because you have like areas that are not like necessarily low income for the average income murder, but you still zero of those units are affordable. It's just, you know, it just kind of, you find things that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, and so just like, now that we know what it looks like, I hope that, you know, this isn't too daunting of, 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 um, of a project to kind of take on yourself for whatever data you find interesting. And hopefully some of this made sense in terms of what each of these lines does and how it leads you to that final product. But, um, you know, I think that once you get past that point, and I don't know what everyone's experience level is in this room, but for me, once you get past that point of saying, you know, I can do this, I can have these things on my own, um, you know, it opens up a lot of opportunity too to kind of showcase some of that information. Um, so I'll, that's kind of the end of my presentation. Hopefully you can have a little bit of discussion if people have like takeaways or um, 
questions or thoughts about, you know, what you might want to be able to visualize, um, anything else. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Any questions? Yep. Yeah. Just because it was really killing me. MOI is Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> moderate income. Yeah. Between low income and middle income, we call it moderate. Be careful. Oh, sorry. Okay. Who's the question? Okay. Go ahead. Just wanted to air speaking. I'll take a look at all. Here. Then... We got a couple. We... We'll share. So what's interesting, so this is the thing, you know, um, some neighborhoods, you know, the, the, the median income says $65,000, a good number of recorded units. And for that income earner, 89% of those units are affordable. But again, that's the median income, right? So there's a host of incomes of the people who need housing, arguably the most, 30, 000, who are still missing this. But I, I can't, you know, there's limitations to the project, right? Like I can't say every, I don't know exactly everyone's income. The only, you know, reliable income number that I can use is the median income. And so it really just, it, it's really just kind of scratches the surface. But again, the median is, I mean, is the middle. So there's half of the population of that neighborhood makes less than that. So that's Harlem South. Can we do the rest of Harlem? Yep. Yeah, exactly. So like you have Harlem North, 57% East Harlem, maybe some of the most housing units built or preserved of the neighborhood and only 20% are affordable. I know there's been, okay. So yeah, South Bronx has seen a lot of development recently. They've re recorded 25,000 units. And this is the plan that was initially, you know, created by de Blasio housing, New York. It, it, it was a number, right? I believe it was 300,000 units by 2026. And that was the policy was building or preserving 300,000 units by 2026. And so that kind of creates an incentive to, to record as many units as you can, because you want to hit that number. So if you're, if your strategy is quantitative from the beginning, I feel like you're almost starting on the wrong foot mm -hmm. and you're kind of manifesting this mismatch because you want to hit that number. You, you don't want to say you failed or like your policy failed. So they'll record any number, any unit they can. And, um, and so they have, they'll just say 25,000 units in, in Mott Haven, but like who's, who can, who can live there? And I know that, you know, I, I feel like I keep introducing caveats cause I don't want to like, um, just in case, but you know, it's such a complex issue. I don't want to like skew the way that some I'm trying to show that some data is skewed. I don't want to do the same. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, lots of people can move into neighborhoods. And I think that a big, you know, um, there's a lot of policies that are about addressing segregation and everything. Um, but I think there is something to say about a neighborhood affording its own housing. Right. And so people are filling those units and they're, they're meeting people's needs. Some, you know, some people, but it's just, you know, another thing to think, consider is like, what about the people down the street, especially in neighborhoods where housing insecurity is a serious issue? Well, especially you'd bother people in a neighborhood that have been there for a while, or maybe for his house and owns, maybe mm -hmm. they'll be in the and charging you apartments, you know, about clean four thousand dollars a month. Right. You obviously like he pushed those couple out and put the other people in. And to me it really started with um Julianan when uh they didn't move when they did the vacancy D control. And to me that's when everything started going um crazy and then Uber came in uh with his mindset of raising uh downtown Brooklyn and putting up uh, condominium mm -hmm. all over the place. I mean, I just don't know where they expected the New Yorkers that where they had to go. Right. I right. understand. Same thing in Harlem and in South Bronx and all this other stuff. I mean, all this building is going more than the people can. Right. Well, because I mean, yeah, I think it's like, um, 
these are some of the things that we can kind of back up with this kind of research. And I think that that's what's so interesting about it is like, you can, you can show people this, like you can show what you've done and, and you can't, then this is the date, this is data coming from the city. So, you know, what are they, what are they going to say? Like our data is wrong. <laughs> like, uh, no. So, you know, and I think that. So you have another question I'm sure. And you have Nina. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, like, it's a super <clears throat> thing, and I definitely have ideas of what I would want to do next. Like, mm -hmm. um, like why why use the neighborhood level to maybe do the median income per block or help things like really see? Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's important to note that if I'm understanding correctly, it's so that you can fully show the situation, because this is really just showing an assessment of the city's attempt at forcing developers put affordable housing. It's not actually what the actual rents are in the thousands of buildings that already used it. Is that so I would love up to that. We'll pipe on top of this to do uh, how the rents are increasing in the non new developments. So uh, I think this, yeah, this is a great example of how far the affordable housing that they force developers to do yeah, not equally affordable, mm -hmm. but the rents are also going up. So uh, that's something I would love uh, to see. And then I have one more question, and I can't can't remember it, but uh, yeah, this is. Uh, oh yeah, are you aware of any efforts in city government or state government, any legislation, any talk at all, any politician to <laughs> change to the income level from citywide to any smaller sizes now uh, is there any talk about that <laughs> good yeah that's a good question well to your first point that's like amazing because that was the whole point right is to like spark new ideas for how you can build on this or um answer newer or your own questions so that's great to hear and then um in terms of you know adjusting the uh how we measure area median income i think there is a lot of debate around that i think people always kind of kick it because it's it's a it's a federal government thing it's it's a HUD uh, jurisdiction almost so people always say like oh that's out of our control blah blah there there are like some I think actual uh, question new questions that raise with local AMI but I think what's I kind of come to this realization that you could whatever the benchmark is that's fine but it depends on it's it's what you do with it right if you say okay in this geography. The, the area median income is $130,000. Okay, that's fine. So we'll just only build zero to 30% of that, right? Because like you're doing a percentage of that number. So that number could be any number, but your percentage just has to equal what people need. Like right? by federal pottery line. Right. So it's like, you, as long as you're not counting that as affordable and you're just focusing on what people actually need, if that's 12% of that number, then sure, but just go with that number. You know what I mean? So it's like almost not even about the area median income, but it's about what percentage of that you're targeting in your policy. Well, we you were asking for an A mind just for Harlem. Mm -hmm. And the Congress person, I'm not gonna call him that third down, but was in at the time ignored it completely because we saw we saw what the problem was. You cannot bring in less chest and all this other stuff into Harlem and say that that's an average. I mean, it's it just out of bounds in terms of what the, those folks are making, uh, most of those folks are maybe, and what they can pay for as far as rent was concerned. And um, as you said, HUD is involved in this. And my thing is, we really need to stop requesting it from here because we have Congress people. They're just not listening. And a lot of them are getting money from these developers. That's the reality of um, for their run for office and all this other kind of stuff. We really need to, I guess, maybe New York can start and reach out to other areas uh, and deal with the Congress people who are repping us. And HUD was creating this, this policy that it is not working in terms of housing for, for, for human beings in this country. Right. Yeah, I think I think there's like, a lot of ways that this could be addressed. It's a man-made issue, right? Like how we how we calculate affordability 
can always change. And so if, whether that's at the federal level or if at the city level, we just address, we just shift what we consider affordable based on that number. Like those are things that can always happen. Are there any other? Tina, do you still have a question? Um, I was going to ask about like, where did you put on that microphone? Oh, thank you. Oh, I was going to ask, uh, how were you able to get the map into the uh, code? So you were taking it from like, the website and hit just run it? Yeah, so that's a good question. Yeah, so um, the base map, what you see is it's anything that's not what we made. What we made are these shapes of purple, <laughs> right, and gray. That's what we put on the base map. The base map, which is this detailed map of everything else, that was one line of code that just said, put in this map, um, because that's, that's never changing, right? I'll, sh I'll show you. Um, that was this dormant. It's, it's, it's a base map of, and it's called, like, Carto is this uh, company that does this work, um, and it's, it's within the leaflet package that we, that we import it that allows you to add a base map. I like this one, but there's a bunch of different themed maps that you can use. Um, to just kind of orient yourself, right? But what we did was cr just create those purple tiles of, of neighborhoods. Yes. So where would you find like that string that you added to the provider tile? This? Yeah, that's it. So um, they actually, they have, so Positron is like the theme name of this one. Also, in addition to Cardo, a couple other companies have, have base map tiles as well. Um, but I think uh, you can you can just look it up online. Usually, like Cardo will provide a list of, or like um, for for specifically Leaflet for R, they'll provide a list of strings like this one that I use in quotes. Cardo DB Positron that'll that'll work as a base map. So this would be in the like Leaflet R package documentation. Yeah, it'll be in documentation like that. Or Cardo will provide the list of names of maps that they make. Bad. Can you need to have a part of subscription to use the Positron base map or? No. Yeah. So everything I did was totally free, which is great. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. Um, like all I had to do before this was obviously download R, which is free, download R Studio, which is also free. Um, all these packages are free. Read Socrata and the API for the, it's called an API when you, when you just pull data directly in. You're not like downloading the data and then uploading it back. Um, this was all free. I just had to create a, like a username and password and stuff. So maybe they track it, but <laughs> I, th I thought it was worth it. Um, and then, um, yeah, everything else is, is totally created open source. How much control do you have in terms of the UI and UX when you're creating a, a map like that? Yeah. The curl R. Yeah, so the R shiny does a lot, but it's far, I would say it's far more limited than like uh, coding language that's designed for web design, right? Some, some people actually who are really good at R, you can, you can, you can code HTML for something else in R, um, but it's, it's the HTML language. In terms of language that's specific to R and what we did, um, it's all, because it's all so easy, it's all pre-designed for you. So if you want to mess with that, some things you can mess with, some things you can look at. How, how interactive can you make the map? You can make it pretty interactive. I mean, I've, I've, this is a sort of almost like a simplified version of one that I've made where it's different tabs. You can do filters. You can search addresses. You can do all that stuff. Okay, okay cool. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, it's cool if you don't have an answer. I don't know how long you've been doing R, but you, know, you said that you didn't know how to throw in stuff before. So any recommendation for uh, R. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So what, um, what I did was I did a free trial of code Academy, uh, one week. Um, it was a week that I had a lot of free time <laughs> and, um, and then from there it was just self-taught. Um, there's this thing called stack overflow, which is the best. Um, best. it's, it's literally yeah, the best. Yeah. You know, it's, question. It's, it's just a blog. It's like a Q and a blog for code. And so if you Google, if you Google a really specific question about R, like how do I make the, them purple from light to dark? Like someone has asked that on Stack Overflow. 
And so for me, it was literally just Googling. You can read documentation. That's It's all free. Like, I never pin in. The Code Academy is a, the name? The Code Academy is a, is a website. It's, it's, a, it's usually a subscription-based uh, tutoring service, um, but they also have free trials. So it gives, it gives you a grounds to like learn the syntax and get just your head around it enough that you know what to Google, basically. But that sort of is my head proud. And, and it's like, I, you know, like, I was not a coder person and I'm still not, you know, like, but like, you're still able to do stuff like this with just a little bit of the chip. Yes. How was that cost of best book I ever used on R was R for pilots. Okay. Yeah, yeah, actually a free one on it will show you the base R stuff. Mm -hmm. And R, like R, makes all of its own documentation free as well. Like they have their own documentation of how to use R. Sometimes it gets a little in the weeds, but um, it's all free. Like I think you should just do as much Googling as you can, really. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Stephen. Thank you guys for coming.